Hey everyone, it's Ross Anderson here from Brave New World Wine in Sydney. And uh, welcome to episode number six of Meet the Maker. Um, and this is our first one uh, featuring some homegrown talents and cutting edge Australian winemaking. And as always, we hope to uh, inform, entertain and educate you uh, with these interviews and introduce you to people that you wouldn't necessarily know about. Now, I first met today's guest in 2018 where uh, he was invited to come and sit as an associate judge in the Australian and New Zealand Boutique Wine Show. Um, he did such a great job that year, working alongside the likes of Hugh and Hook, uh, Master of Wine, Tony Patterson, and a range of other winemakers, wine critics, wine reviewers, that he was immediately booked and invited to come back for the 2019 show. He would have been in Sydney for the 2020 show as well, because he's part of the furniture now. But unfortunately, this year has thrown many curveballs our way. So we look forward to welcoming him back in 2021. Now, it's fair to say that um, our guest tonight really enjoys getting to the cold face of wine and exposing himself and immersing himself in all things to do with wine, wine tasting, wine events, education, and definitely wine judging. Um, his wines speak for themselves. He's championing, uh, championing alternate varieties, uh, spearheaded by his love of Grenache and a number of other interesting varieties, and just showing uh, what Australia is possible uh, in doing in these in these varieties. So without any further ado, please welcome Rob Mack from Athelian Wines, and he's joining us live from McLaren Vale. And here he comes. Hey, Rob, how are you, mate? Hey, Ross. Doing well, mate. Thank you very much for having me on. Great having you on. Thank you for being the first Australian to join us. We've uh, we've had uh, South African winemakers. We've had, uh, I don't know if you've seen one of these episodes, we've had a, a rock star from uh, the US and we've had Virginie uh, joining us from New Zealand. But it's good to get uh, back on home soil and welcome you to uh, Meet the Maker. Um, Rob, tell us a few things. Uh, tell us what's happening in the beautiful McLaren Vale at the moment. Uh, how, how, how's Vibe? What's happening in the industry over there? What are you hearing on the streets uh, with your fellow winemakers? Yeah, it's an interesting time, obviously. Um, everything's kind of feels like it's kind of normal down here at the moment. It's nice being sort of slightly removed from a, a capital city, I guess, as well. Um, but uh, yeah, look, as of the last sort of two or three months, everything's kind of got back to, to normal down here. You know, we can we can catch up with mates and have a beer and, and it always almost feels normal. But then we we look sort of across the borders and, and things aren't so aren't so flash in other parts of the country. And just uh, yeah, we're just really, really lucky to be in this little little corner, I think, at the moment. Um, but at the same time, I'm kind of itching to to get back out and uh, and be able to travel freely again. So like you say, I, I would have been in in Sydney very soon, um, but unfortunately, yeah, had to had to push it back this year. Yeah, you could be in a worse place than McLaren Vale, that's for sure. I'd, I'd love to be in McLaren Vale right now, that's for sure. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. Um, tell us a little bit about your story, uh, Rob. It always it hasn't always been about wine. Uh, I know you've uh, done other bits and pieces. So tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, I uh, know there's quite a gap from school through to sort of working in wine, I guess. Uh, wine became a passion of mine uh, right around 05, 2005, so 15 odd years back. Um, but at the time had no sort of intention to turn that into a into a career. Um, started a, a business degree actually and, and completed an accounting degree in, when I lived in Sydney for a while. Um, I'm born and bred around this area, but, but moved to Sydney for five or six years and that's where I met uh, Louise, my wife. Um, and yes, yeah, so I finished the accounting degree, but pretty quickly realized that that wasn't the, uh, the kind of field I wanted to be in once I was in the workplace. So um, took a bit of time off and worked at Vintage in uh, Clare in 2010 at Killicanoo, which I think uh, was an amazing crew. And I'm, I reckon it's very lucky that that was my first real experience in, in production because that's what really spurned on my, my decision to kind of change tack completely and start a... Um, another degree at uh, Charles Sturt University, which was a wine science, wine making degree. Um, and at the same time, a job opened up at a, uh, at a, a wine company in Sydney where I was uh, working on sort of merchandising and buying side. So got to apply the, the finance knowledge that I gained um, at, uh, in that first degree. And then uh, sort of found out about the, the whole commercial side, which was great. I'm, I'm really happy that I've kind of gone the opposite direction to most winemakers that start making and then figuring out how to sell I the business, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I went I did the important parts first which is obviously being able to move uh, move some stock and then uh, yeah progressively um, built my knowledge on 
on winemaking and production side after that. So when were you at uni? What, what years were that? Was that 2010? It was 10, when was it? 11, early 11 was the start. And it's a yeah. part-time yeah. degree. Uh, so it goes for six years. So it's, been, yeah. it's a fair, yeah. fair whack of time. I sped things up a little bit. So I finished at the end of 16. So it turned out to be a five year yeah. degree. Um, it's a great, great course because it's structured around people already working in the, in the industry. So they know that basically from February through to April, we're not going to do any, anything because it's vintage and, um, you know, we don't see family, so let alone do, do uni work. Um, so yeah, it was structured really well. Um, still got some great mates who, who were, who went through that with me and a couple in McLaren Vale too, which we catch up with, caught up with them last night. So, um, yeah, it, it was, it was a really, really hands-on good degree. It's interesting that uh, you chose Charles Sturt. Was that for a reason? Uh, because of the flexibility as opposed to um, Roseworthy or Wake Campus? That's the main reason. Um, I was still living in Sydney at the time as well. Um, but we moved back We moved back home in 2013. So I was about two years into the degree. And I did think about switching across to Adelaide. but uh, And they do offer it part-time. But the issue is there's still quite a lot of contact hours. So I'd still you know, say two days a week I'd have to be there. Um, whereas with Charles Sturt, I just had to go to Wagga uh, which is a bit of a hole from here. It's about a 10 hour drive. So, um, yeah. wasn't the easiest place to get to. Um, but yeah, so two weeks, three weeks of the year. Um, and that was it as far as face-to-face -face commitments go. The rest was all online or, um, invigilated exams and things like that. It's uh, interesting what you were saying there with you, you're starting with the business side and then moving to the wine side. Um, the, the business model of Brave New World is very similar to that. Uh, my business partner comes from a finance and tech background, and it's great. He has a massive passion for wine. You've met him. Yep, um, yep, yep. He, he comes with the business acumen and the, the sensibility that says you can't buy that. Uh, you can buy that. And that's not going to work here, and let's not do this. And you know, yep. we, we drive with the passion for the wine, and we just go and do it. But he's uh, sitting there going, this is not a good decision. That's not a good decision. This is a better one. So it, it's really important, um, especially in this day and age, uh, especially at the moment with 2020 and all the stuff that we're dealing with. But so you finished in 2016 with uh, with Charles Sturt. Yep. Um, and Aphelion started around about 2014, 2015. Mm -hmm. so, so a bit of yeah, overlap there. A bit of overlap towards the end, yeah. And so what was that? What was that moment when you were sitting behind the desk in Deloitte um, or in, in accounting, and you said, "No, this is not a. This is. Uh, I want some wine action." What, do, do you remember that moment? Uh, it was probably the, when I did the vintage, it was actually in the gap between finishing the business degree. There was about a six month, uh, gap between finishing and then starting at Deloitte. So, um, I got the taste for it and got bitten by the bug before I actually started working there properly. So it's not so much a reflection I'd say on, on the accounting work itself. It's more the fact that I knew the other opportunity that was out there and I thought I was, yeah. 30 at the time. So I was, you know, getting to the point where if I wanted to make a, a career for myself, um, I wouldn't be able to keep chopping and changing for, for too much longer. Um, so that, that was, that was the decision making process there. And, and the fact that the role opened up in Sydney at the same time as it was quite a, a smooth transition across, um, which made a lot of sense at, at, at the time. Um, and it was actually that company that I worked with in, uh, in Sydney that allowed uh, me to move back and straight into a production role in in McLaren Vale, um, which was another smooth transition. So, uh, I've been I have been lucky as far as that goes, um, and uh, yeah, it was it was a good way to to move back home without just having nothing and and uh, yeah. starting from yeah. scratch again. Yeah. And, and where did this passion for the alternate varieties come from? I mean, in particular, you're, you're known uh, in our world for Grash. Um, and if you have a look at your website, it's Grenache and it's Chenin Blanc and Mataro and um, other interesting bits and pieces. You, obviously, you make uh, Shiraz. Uh, was it Sagrantino? Is that the other one? Yeah, that's another one. Yeah. So w where did this um, passion for these alternate varieties, in particular Grenache, come from? Yeah. So it's, it's good to hear calling Grenache an alternative variety still because it certainly was when we started. Um, it was very hard to to get people to uh to buy grenache once they tasted it, it was fine um but it, it was still a hand sell and at the moment um so in, in just in that six or seven years it's changed completely and and uh, uh we've been sort of at the front of that wave with a few other uh, mclaren vale and, and barossa producers in particular um really driving the qualities and the and, and working on the style of grenache that um 
really shouts about drinkability. So the thing I love about Grenache is you can have complexity, but the drinkability factor is so high as well. So you can switch off and just, you know, have a glass and enjoy it, or you can you can go into sort of wine nerd mode and pull it apart and really think think hard about it. And there's plenty to, to see there. So, um, but yeah, alternate varieties as a rule, uh, they suit they suit growing down here. So Grenache, Mataru in particular, are two that really, really suit this climate. They're, that's where they were grown in Spain and France traditionally for a very long time and the climates are very similar. So that was almost a no brainer. And and like I say, the, the, the drinkability and the, the amount of variety that we can put into the winemaking process with Grenache is a, is a real draw card. Um, you know, we can play with whole bunch ferments, we can play with uh, very extended skin contact ferments, um, different oak regimes, size of oak. We never use new oak, but you know, we, we have barrels from 200 litres up to two and a half thousand litres. So playing around with that sort of thing. Um, and then, yeah, outside of those two, the Shannon uh, is from one of the you know, it is from the first vineyard that we that we started working with back in fourteen, um, an amazing fifty year old uh, plot, which is for Shannon is extremely old. Um, the Brini vineyard, to, the Brini vineyard, yeah, yeah. So, so the Brini family they've been up there for well, a couple of generations now, um, and Marcelo yeah, it's a beautiful Brini. Site. Yeah, sorry, is that is his name Marcelo? Uh, not Marcello, but they'd be calling Marcello. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, like he, he he runs. He's got two sons who um, who help him out, and uh, it's again another family business. And all the growers that we work with, we only have uh, uh, three or four, and most of them have been with us from, with us from the start. They're all family run, um, you know, husband wife family sort of uh, operations. And it's, that's another thing that's very important for us too is surrounding us with with great people um, and forming those yeah. long long relationships. How much Shannon uh, is grown? I mean, I know there's a bit in Margaret River. And there's a bit in McLaren Vale. I always associated Coriol with uh, a Shannon, um, and obviously the Brini Vineyard. Uh, but is there a lot of other Shannon in there, or was it just very small plantations of it? There's a couple of other blocks in Blewett Springs, in the sub region that that uh, the Brinies are in. So in the top, the top sort of north inland corner of uh, McLaren Vale, it's a bit higher up, a bit cooler. So that's why it suits things like the whites a bit more than say down here on the on the flats. Um, yep. So yeah, there's a couple of other blocks that I know of. Uh, we do a, a Shannon from the Hills, uh, which I, I think we're going to talk about tonight. Um, yep. That's the only yep. vineyard in the Adelaide Hills, um, and that's also the is only that wine. The, that we can't really, yeah, that's the Pier. Uh, no, the, so the Pier is the that's the yep. Bacchanal one, and yep. the, the Cryos yep. is the Adelaide Hills one. And that's oh, the only so that's wine. That's the Cryos. That yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, so it's the only wine we that's produce sort of outside of uh, the, the McLaren Vale region. But yeah, it's mostly over west. It's mostly over west, um, like you say, Margaret River, um, Swan Valley has quite a quite a bit as well. So, um, and that's yeah, it's, a lot of that is due to the South African uh, immigration over there, um, as yep. you know very well. It's, uh, it's a very popular I'm variety. Of, uh, yeah, <laughs> they brought a lot of countries. We've, um, yeah, we've tasted a lot of Shannon in the last few weeks with um, the stock that's inbound, um, and. Uh, there's so many similarities to a Stellenbosch Shannon, and yet there's yep. something different in here. There's a there's an, another level of complexity in this wine as opposed to what we're used to there. It's just it's beautiful. Quite different. Um, that? yeah, that, that's the leaner of the two yeah. styles that we do as well. So we try and capture as much sort of fruit and um, really vibrant uh, character in that one. Um, no oak; it's all stainless steel ferment. The other Shannon that we do off of uh, Brinney's Blue at Springs block goes half through uh, a neutral oak ferment. And is kept on um, ferment leaves, um, stirred, so made to be much more textural, a bit more chardonnay like, I guess you'd say, if, you, if you're looking for comparisons. Whereas this one is more, say, down the line of a Riesling or Semillon kind of uh, yeah. character. Yeah. Interesting. And now you mentioned the, the the couple of the pioneers with the Grenache movement in the Barossa. Um, is that um, thistle down like uh, Giles and Alex Head from uh, Headwines? Yeah, so other guys. Alex, I mean, he's doing that ancestor stuff, the ancestor vine. Yep, yeah, the stuff up there. I mean, a lot of people have been working with Grenache for a long time up there, but it's been made uh, same as down here in a style that's probably more more like a Shiraz than a than a yeah. the delicacy yeah. that, that Grenache can can really thrive on. So, um, but yeah, there's been some really good examples going a long way back, but they were few and far between. Um, whereas now, yeah, Thistledown's a good example. Um, they've been uh around maybe two or three years longer than we have um and they've got some amazing fruit sauce and 
um, yeah, Giles knows his, his wine making back to front. Um, so I've caught up with him a few times to, to pick his brain on that. Um, and they, they source from McLaren Vale and uh, Barossa, obviously. So it's, it's really interesting to see um, the comparisons between the regions from a single producer like that too. It's pretty, pretty rare. Mostly it's one foot, you know, or two feet in one, one region and uh, they don't go out of there. But, um, yeah, but they do, so... So this Cryos uh, Shannon that we're tasting, uh, I'm on the 2019 from Adelaide Hills. Mm -hmm. uh, what can you can you tell us anything more about uh, the, the wine itself? Uh, have you got you have you are you joining or are you um, you know the wine? I, don't, by the I don't have it here at the moment. No, I know I've actually been when I was up in <laughs> Brisbane last week. Uh, this is one of the ones we were showing uh, with our distributor in in Queensland and. Um, uh, it was, yeah, so I looked at it quite a lot up there, but um, really, really think it's coming into its own now. It took a while to come through its bottle shop phase. Um, it has been in bottle for about a year now, and it's settled down settled down beautifully. Um, I actually had that open next to uh, five other Shannons uh, last weekend. That was the only one from the hills. The others were from the from the Vale. Um, and yeah, it was it was the freshness. I think is is a key to that wine, and the fact it's under screw cap, makes, you know, means we can retain that um, for uh, many years to come. I think, and um, it's it's made to to have an acid level that that keeps that freshness really you know front of mind. I think that's going to age really well. Um, I see I see that. How's it, how's it going to change over the next couple of years, in your opinion? I guess texturally, so the, the, yeah. So texturally, I've noticed especially on the one that when I tried it last week, that texture is building a bit more. It used to be very um, almost salivating, really juicy that to, to that level, which was intentional. Um, but that that little bit of time in bottle, so we've had it, like I say, we're up to a year now, it really just let, let it fill out a bit, let the fruit flavours fill out a bit. Um, and the fact that even though it wasn't stirred on, on leaves, this one, it did stay on, on full ferment leaves in tank for about three months before bottling. So that did impart a little bit of uh, a little bit of that sort of uh, autolysis, that yeast character to come through, and that will develop more and more. It'll get a bit toasty, um, I'd say. A few toasty characters coming through, maybe a bit honeyed, a bit nutty over the next three or four years. Um, but the freshness, uh, the freshness, I'm pretty confident will will be retained in that for quite quite a long time. I learned something interesting about ten minutes before we joined the call. Um, I often wondered what a um, where is it here. What the Coravin lid, the big ones, would ever be useful for, and they're just sitting in a box somewhere here. And I thought, why, why, why would you even make big Coravin lids? None of these bottles have big Coravin lids. Well, this one has a big Coravin lid, and I can't find the box for the little ones. Oh no! <laughs> oh, that's frustrating. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So there's the whole bottle. Yeah. So that's all right. Oh, yeah, I, I love the glass. We've been using that same same bottle shape since I think it was 2015. We we hooked onto that. It's a save a glass product from from france and it's um i like i do love that slightly wider neck it just seems to pour um yeah, a little bit less of that glug 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 and a bit more just sort of smooth smooth pouring so yeah absolutely yeah so tell us now uh, something interesting um something really um great happened to you in 2018 when you picked up the accolade uh for the young gun of wine awards um it's 2018 Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, what, what was the lead into that, and what was the end result of uh, of picking up that that amazing achievement? Yeah, well, the lead in actually was winning an award from the same competition the year before, which was the uh, best new act, which is the uh, what they call the best first time finalist in the top twelve. So that was that was amazing because that we were getting some good attention up to that point. Um, we hadn't sort of got our production up to the level where we could really be. Um, not selling through within a couple of months. So we'd just taken the leap in 2017 vintage to jump up from around um, three tonne of fruit to 19 tonne of fruit. So really um, push that hard with an idea to, to be able to distribute nationally and maybe even export a little bit. And then this competition came through at exactly the right time, or this this win in the first, the first round in 2017, because um, that's what really got us well-known in the trade particularly, so restaurants, wine bars. Um, and then to, to follow it up the next year with taking out the entire competition, um, which was the first time that that had been done the consecutive um, consecutive years, was probably more a, more a confirmation than anything else, um, that we were you know, certainly on the right track. We were being appreciated by the right people. 
and uh, and and the name was getting well and truly out there by that point. And uh, yeah, it it was it was a very special very special competition because it is it's so unique in 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 the world of wine. It's it's not blind, um, no blind tasting. So everyone who's judging it knows they can see the labels. There's a backstory that that the producer provides, and they put their two wines forward. Not necessarily their best wines, but but they have to be the two wines that tell um, their story as best as they can through through uh, through the wines. So um, in eighteen in seventeen, sorry, the first time around, it was our Grenache and our Sagrantino that got us the the best new act, and in Eighteen, it was our Grenache Mataro Shiraz, the Affinity, and the uh, hundred percent whole bunch, very small production Grenache that we were doing at the time as well, um, that, that got us the, the overall award. And so, on those names that you've just been mentioning, the Confluence, the Rapture, the Affinity, the Tendence, the Emergent, the Ardent, the Cryos, what's the story behind the names? I, I, I was reading the the Aphelian name and its Greek um, uh, meaning. Um, so, what's that connection? What's that story all about? Sure. So, the, so Aphelion means uh, from the sun. It's an ancient Greek term. And when we were sort of throwing ideas around for for what we call our our winery in, in the early days, um, we were throwing around names, places, um, and obviously our names. Have, we were thinking about that too. But then I stumbled across this term, and and we picked it for a couple of reasons. One is because the meaning is so close to what we're all about. It's 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 a hands off production. It's treating the fruit with the, the most respect that we can. So, um, you know, using the sun as the source and uh, and then and then being very, very gentle in the winery. Uh, most of the names have a, uh, except for the cryos and the, and the pier, they are ancient Greek related too. It means uh, cryos is ice and pier is fire. Um, and that's a play on the warmer versus cooler climate, so the hill, Adelaide Hills versus uh, Macomb Vale. The rest of them all have uh, a meaning to do with with what's in the in the bottle, basically. So, for example, Confluence, which is our sort of flagship Grenache, that uh, that is the confluence of our top Grenache batches. Yeah, um, yes. Yes. the Ardent is our Sagrantino, which is our most structured um, tannic framed wine. So, Ardent makes sense to you know it, it makes sense on on that on that level. Um, Emergent for the Mataro, I see Mataro in a space kind of where Grenache was when we started, that um, there's a bit of a movement, a bit of a murmur about uh, about Mataro in the trade and in the industry. And uh, again, it's another variety that, that suits this region so well. Um, and I see it as an emerging um, emerging opportunity and emerging emerging variety. So yeah, well, they all have sort of plays on, on either my thoughts behind the variety or, um, or the wine itself, what's in the, what's in the bottle. So while we're talking about the confluence, uh, I'm on the I'm on the 2019 confluence, and I haven't tasted this yet. But the 2018 confluence, uh, you picked up the trophy for the um, uh, Grenache for the, with the Australian New Zealand Boutique Wine Show, uh, which was uh, so super close uh, to you winning the whole show, uh, and you got just pipped at the post by Home Hill Pinot from Tassie. Uh, and you and I know how close that was, <laughs> literally one point in it, <laughs> so, uh, which was a great accolade. Uh, okay. how, does the 19, how does the 19 compare to the 18? Very different. Um, and that is mostly down to uh, vintage difference. So site-wise, um, very similar. So about 80%, 70, 80%, 70 to 80%, sorry, uh, single vineyard, Br uh, Britney's Grenache. And then it's topped up with uh, another vineyard from uh, the Waits family, and they're just about half a kilometre away. So very close, similar sort of profile. Um, slightly younger vines. The Brinnies, Brinnies vines are around 80 to 85 years old. Um, the Waits is, is a little bit younger than that. Um, but so yeah, vintage condition is, is the main difference here. This one's uh, lighter. Um, the, the 18 was quite a, a dense fruit impact year uh, a lot of intensity they were still um in balance and kind of light on their feet but definitely had a lot more uh a lot more grunt to it i guess um i think the 19 is much closer to what uh i'm trying to achieve with with grenache shows more finesse um a leaner profile uh there's more more freshness i think as well so the the, the acid's a little bit perkier um Texturally, I really like it. It's just a fine little weave of tannin on the finish there, and and that's 
Tannin and Grenache are, are, are quite interesting. Um, I'm only ever looking for just a real fine powdery coating of, of tannin um, because more than that, and it throws the balance out of, of, of the wine. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about the, the 19. We've we've moved on to that a couple of months ago, so it's still relatively relatively new, um, but it's starting to, to get some real attention uh, and, and points as well. So, you know, we, we sent into a couple of critics, um, not many, but... Um, but yeah, the, the few that we have have really sort of got behind it, which is which is great. And how's the twenty looking at the moment? I mean, it's probably too early to tell, but what's the harvest been like for the Grenache? For, that will go into the confluence. Yeah, I think uh, twenty is going to strike a balance between the eighteen and the nineteen. So, I've we actually have a little uh, a little sub range in development at the moment. We've just bottled the first two two wines under that. Which sits at a slightly slightly lower price point, uh, retails around 28, 28 Australian dollars, um, and we've already bottled the twenty twenty Grenache under that that uh, little sub range, and it's extremely impressive. So I'm um, I'm very excited about what the confluence, which is you know, a tier up, um, yeah. can can put can put through. I've already looked at at all the blends for the twenty twenty Grenaches and and Grenache blends. So. I've got a pretty fair idea of what what it's going to look like, and I, I think it it really does have this this beautiful line of balance between the the delicacy of the nineteen, which is about as delicate as we can go without maybe getting a bit too um, a bit too diffuse, but um, and some of the muscularity of the the eighteen. So uh, a bit more whole bunch in there as well, so a bit a little bit more um, sort of herbal edge to it. The twenty twenty will have, whereas the nineteen is quite sort of pure and. And crystalline there's still about 30 percent whole bunch in there but it just doesn't poke out um at all really so uh yeah can't wait we're bottling that in uh late november early december so not too far away now so it's interesting now that you've mentioned that you work with uh, various growers and the brinis and uh all those, those those various participants um and unlike all the other people that we've interviewed and spoken to, which are using that traditional model of having vineyards and a cellar door and all those bits and pieces, your operation sources grapes uh, from growers and you generally tend to make your wine at various locations. Uh, tell us a little bit about that operation and how that works sure. for you as a business model. And, yep. and do you see that as, a, as, a, as a, a business decision and a good way to proceed or do you have plans to maybe invest in a vineyard and, and build a cellar door. Tell us a little bit about, about that aspect. Yeah, well, look, that's probably the only way uh, small players can enter the market if they don't have sort of a family vineyard behind them or a family winery. Um, the amount of capital required to purchase a vineyard and set up a winery from scratch is well beyond anything that we could have we could have put together uh, many, many times more than that. So, so we need people who are just starting off like like we were back in 2014 need to come at it from uh, a different angle and that is by finding the right people to work with so the right growers for the the right sites the right varieties um which which i had relationships already with most of our growers from working in other places so that was relatively easy to to tick off um and then finding the right place to make it so we've been making it at the same site since 2017 now and there's a few other small batch producers that go through here as well. So we just lease space. Um, we pay a, a fee to use equipment um, and and then we just pay a fee based on on the tons of fruit that we put through every, every year. So um, it's still a very hands-on sort of way to do it. They have staff that if I need something done and I can't get to it, then they'll, they'll just get someone to do it. Um, but, um, you know, I'm on site. Same with the picking, um, I'm on site vast majority of the time and, uh, and and are making the making all the decisions so um and that's that's the way things will stay for a while um if if the right vineyard pops up um then we'd certainly consider it it would have to be you know have to tick a lot of boxes and 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 there's not that many around they're very tightly held now um we wouldn't want to just pick a, a pick up a giant shiraz vineyard for example off the market because it just it would make no sense so, <laughs> And then facility-wise, that's another one, but probably even further down the track, because um, I'm quite happy with with uh, sort of the current arrangements, and and I think vineyard source is is definitely more more important than production site. Um, yeah. you know, a pump's a pump, and a tank's a tank, so um, that's that's fine. As long as I've got free access to a site, then I'm more than happy just to to keep it 
keep it the way it is. Yeah. I think it gives you flexibility to adapt, especially with like current conditions. You know, it could have been really tricky if you'd uh, had those investments in line and um, yeah, un- unknown financial future. No, exactly right. It also opens up a lot more doors as far as um, the, the wine goes because we can, like I said, the confluence is of our best Grenache batches and that usually comes from two or three growers across maybe two or three vineyards. So if I just had access to a single vineyard and that was it, um, you know, it would be great. I'd have purity of sight, but I may not have the layers um, of that that comes from from different sites as well. So yeah, there's pros and cons in every, every direction, but um, yeah, it's working well so far. I know we've already touched on um, other people pioneering the Grenache in the area. We've touched on Giles, etc. But the hashtag Team Grenache, which we've also got up on the screen here, the, this initiative with Giles Cook. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, so that that um, that came from from them. We were approached. Um, they've got a a man in Sydney called Paddy who takes care of all of their sort of sales and marketing side of things, um, and he could see as well as anyone that things were were slowing down pretty pretty hard uh, in the early days. So this was back in, I reckon, April, somewhere around there. So just on the tail end of vintage. And he gave me a call and he said, what uh, what do you think about teaming up, um, the two of us, uh, the two of our, our two producers, and offering a couple of mixed cases um, to our database, respective databases, uh, running some social media stuff. Um, Louise is our social media guru, I don't know much about it. So she jumped on that and and uh, and ran with it. And uh, it, it's wrapped up now. So that, that lasted for about three months, four months. And it was always ever going to be a limited uh, offer. Doesn't mean we won't do the same thing again, but um, it was really well received. We, we moved through uh, a bit more stock than we thought we would. Um, and we also offered a, so it was mostly Grenache, um, but we also offered a, a case that had a, one of our Shannons and one of their Chardonnays in there too, in case yeah, people didn't want 100% Grenache. So your, um, the Shirazes that you make, how do they compare uh, stylistically to other McLaren Vale producers? The, the, uh, probably not the right word, but the old school, the establishment Shirazes from McLaren Vale. How do your Shirazes, the uh, tendons? Yep. And That's the only one. The, how, how, do that, how does that compare stylistically? Because I haven't opened that one this evening. That might be for tomorrow. Yeah, no worries. Um, <laughs> so I'd say certainly on the leaner end, um, what I love uh, when I show people our wines is that I, don't, I never prompt it, but when I hear it, it's great um, that they can see a line of similarity as far as uh, freshness, drinkability, things like that go. Because that's what that's what we're after, and it's hard to get that into a Shiraz that has been you know, pummeled with new American oak or picked quite late to be extremely ripe. Um, so we try and we try and work. We have a single grower um, for our Shiraz, uh, Ross McMurtry. He he's uh, got a couple of vineyards just in the central part of, of the Vale. His family's been here for well over a hundred years, and they know he knows the the, the sites back to front, um, and. So following on from that sort of line of thinking with the freshness and the vibrancy, uh, we've used very little in the way of new oak. Um, we we only purchase new oak maybe one barrel every two or three years. And it does see Shiraz to start with and then progressively we'll move to usually Mataro and then maybe Sagrantino and then Grenache at the end once there's no more oak flavour influence coming through. Um, so I'm not sure if that's possibly the 17 you've got there or the 18, I'm not sure, but the, the 17 had no new oak. Um, the 18 had about... Yeah. 17, yeah, so no new work on that at all. The 18 uh, saw about 15%, and that is the highest I think we'd ever we'd ever go, and that's because 18 was quite a powerful fruit year, like I was talking about earlier. Um, so, yeah, picking times a bit earlier, um, looking for a more savoury kind of style, I guess. I'm not looking for a, a big fruit-forward style, which is which is pretty popular in, in these parts and still still is. Um, so, yeah, we, we like to make wines that, that drink well with, with food and and I think a sort of a bigger jammy style Shiraz, it's hard to hard to match to. So so ours is more yeah. more in line with say a uh, I guess we've had comparisons to to the you know the Rhone and things like that. So yeah. just a slightly more savoury edge. I was about to say Rhone style. Yeah. Um, tell us if you're able to tell us a little bit about your future plans. Have you got anything uh, in the in the pipeline? Uh, any plans to extend the alternate varieties into some other bits and pieces? Uh, what can you share with us? 
Yeah, there's a few things. So uh, at the front part of our property, actually in the room I'm sitting in now, we've uh, created a, a little tasting room. So we can take groups of up to uh, up to 10, um, sitting down at, at the table that we've got here, uh, and I'll take them through. So it's by appointment. Um, we just jump on the website and and, uh, and book a book a session. I set, set aside at least an hour um, with each group, and that's one group at a time. So you have 100% of... Uh, of my attention and usually Louise will be there and sometimes Claret, our little one will start doing somersaults on the floor and things like this. So it's, <laughs> it's a pretty casual environment. Um, and, and most people have responded really, really well to it. Um, the other thing we've started doing too is, is another tasting option up at, uh, Marsh's, Marsh Bruni's vineyard where I'll drive the Utah, I'll meet, meet the customers there and I'll just literally put out the wines on the back of the, the U tray and we'll drink, you know, the wines that came from that vineyard, um, standing in basically in the vineyard. So uh, that's been that's been uh, starting to get pretty popular too. With the you know, spring coming on, it's um, not really a winter event, but uh, yeah, the sun's shining um, quite a bit these days, which is which is good. So getting a lot of attention there. Um, so that's as far as tasting room and visitors go. We're certainly encouraging people to to come through and have a look for themselves. Uh, with the New varieties that we're working with. Um, I did mention that uh, that new that new range that we're doing. It's called the Welkin, which is uh, an old English term. It means vault of the sky. So, playing into the the branding, trying to keep everything quite consistent. Um, looks a bit different to the to the labels you got behind you there, um, but it still is branded caps. Aphelion still has it has Aphelion sort of written on different parts of the label. So we want people to know it's us, um, but we want it to be distinct too. So. Um, and the idea behind that range is is even more vibrancy, earlier release. So like I say, the 2020 Grenache is out now um, and we're bottling the rest of them in, in November. Um, only a small range, so there's only going to be five all up at the moment, um, which is a Shannon, funnily enough, uh, a Grenache, a Nero. So we're playing around with Nero as well. Um, Sagrantino Mataro blend, um, which, is, which is a really beautiful sort of, Plushness, a bit of plushness from the Matara and it's real crunch of of, uh, of vibrancy from the Sagrantina. And uh, a one-off production, which is bottling this year as well, which is a Langhorn Creek Malbec. And uh, that's part of a project that we are part of from the Great Council in Langhorn Creek called Project 5255, which is the postcode over there. Um, and what they did, they selected three winemakers who well, there was an application process. They selected three winemakers where they basically gifted two ton of fruit of our choice, variety of our choice. We could make it however we wanted, um, as long as it um, had the project logo on the label. And obviously we talked about it on social media and all that sort of thing. So um, that's that's a really exciting project to be a part of. I've never worked with Langhorn Creek fruit, but um, I love Malbec out of Langhorn Creek. It was one of, it was an easy choice for me, was, was jumping on board with that. Yeah, and they've got uh, Charlotte, Charlotte Hardy and um, uh, Turon White from the from the hills. So it's it's a nice little mix, and and uh, yeah, Charlotte did Fiano and Turon did Grenache. So that's interesting. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so there the, that's the small range. Probably doing a rosé next next year as well, um, which will slip into that into that uh, Welkin range too. Fantastic. I don't know if you can see the screen at the same time as um, as I can there, Rob, but we've got some messages coming through. Uh, a message from uh, Johan uh, says, always love to love a story where a person with vision approaches a well-established and capital-intensive industry from a different perspective, uh, challenges the convention and being smart about the business case. Most certainly going to try your wine. So there you go. Rob, there's uh, someone that we need to uh, need to. Uh, Johan, I'll send you. I'll send you the link. Uh, yeah, get in sure. touch with uh, with Rob. Um, got a question for you, Rob. It's uh, slightly mm. left field. We did a uh, we did a tasting a couple of nights ago with um, a winery uh, from uh, Cape Town uh, down at the coast. Uh, specialises in Chardonnay, and, uh, Pinot Noir, and then a couple of Bordeaux blends, but um, small format bottles, uh, tasting kits, these kind of things. So this is a very rudimentary version of of what we use, but it was bottled in. Um, in plastic to reduce the weight, and uh, it was shipped over air freight. Um, and we did a private tasting uh, two nights ago with a group of about 18 people and the winemaker. What do you think about that in terms of the Australian market uh, and consumers' uh, receptiveness to something like this? And obviously, this is 
the, the wrong word is crude, but it would be bottled in glass and have a proper seal on it, etc. Um, do you think there is space in the market for something like that? I think especially at the moment. Yeah, look, this is something that, that Louise especially has brought up uh, for the last couple of months and saying we should get on this. And, and I, I, she was telling me about it yesterday again. So, so she's certainly keen. Um, there is a space in the market. It is quite an intensive way to sell wine because it is literally sitting down decanting out of larger bottles into smaller bottles. It's all by hand and then making sure that none of the uh, integrity of the wine is lost through that. So um, I'm quite fussy about making sure that it's still going to look 100% right um, and not dropping the ball on that. But um, look, it seems to be, there seems to be more and more Australian producers doing that as well. Um, in fact, there was a, a Wine Australia event uh, in the UK last night, which was um, run by well, Charles Cook, was one of the presenters there, um, along with Sarah Ahmed and, and a few others. And, uh, and instead of shipping over full bottles of our wine, we were one of about eight producers who, who were part of this uh, Wine Australia trade event. Um, they decanted them into, into smaller jars and then sent them around the country over in the UK, um, partly because of the restrictions, but I think also yeah. just to, to give that a go and, and um, yeah, from all reports, uh, went down really well. So, yeah, it's definitely a place for it. And certainly whether it's just for consumers or for, for trade as well. So, like you say, sending out air freighting across little samples like that makes a lot more sense than sending out a full dozen um, really? which it's a, it's a lot of it's a lot of stock but it's also a lot of cost so um, certainly for doing it air freight it would be yeah crazy but um, yeah I, I, I'm going to sell, I'm going to jump on that it's just a matter of priorities and um, I, I think it should bump up the list a bit probably yeah no, we're, we're focusing on it quite heavily at the moment and um, doing a fair bit of research into the viability and we can see massive business cases for it in, in trade and the direct to consumer uh, so we'll uh, we'll keep you in the loop on that. Um, we'll yeah, share, yeah, share intel. Back. Very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, tell us about your favourite wine memory, Rob. Favourite wine memory? It's probably the one that got me. It got me from being interested in wine to really kind of. I think everyone has that experience where they cross over from, you know, I'll have a glass of wine to dinner to um, to, to to turning it into a passion, um, and that was actually a in 05, uh, just after I moved back to or moved to Sydney, um, where I met Louise, it was a, a bottle of Barolo, um, funnily enough. And it was kind of like a, a light bulb sort of moment. Um, how I couldn't, I had never tried a wine like this before, this quality that, that had um, just these amount of layers uh, and intensity to it, but still in such a delicate sort of frame. Um, and I can still, I can still remember tasting it now. It was, it was a real, set me down the path and and i think those kind of events in life are uh are pivotal there's usually two or three uh that that really change change lives and that was that was one of them um uh, yeah barolo is still probably my one of my loves it's strong a strong love i worked in the region in 2017 so that's the only overseas vintage i've i've done um and louise came with me and our little three-year-old at the uh, sorry three-month-old at the time so we all flew over there and uh and worked at, at Vira, GD Vira in Barolo uh, for three and a half months. So that sort of really nailed down that passion. And um, it's interesting. I was talking with Steve Steve Pennell the other day about the similarities between uh, Grenache and, and Nebbiolo as well. As you'd never think it, but if, you, if it's a really interesting experiment, if you have a good a good Nebbiolo, so a Barolo or maybe a more accessible uh, version. Put it next to a Grenache and see how, see what kind of similar similarities you can see with, um, with with the vibrancy, with the delicacy, but still the intensity. It's it's you'd never think it, but it's it's a, there's a, a lot of bridges that that link the two varieties. Yeah, I um I still remember my uh, my first taste of DRC, yeah. and it was in two thousand and three, two thousand and four. I can remember the setting, I can remember the time of the day, and I can remember the flavor profile. Mm. Um, one and only time I've tasted it and possibly will ever taste it but there you go <laughs> yeah I've, I've only had it once myself and that, that was at the len evans tutorial last year where they put a, a flight of of all of the drcs in front of us um and yeah that 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 was uh that whole experience was just just amazing just ridiculous last year and um nothing could 
could have prepared me for for what I what I saw there. Um, the best wines in the world all laid out in front of us, and and um, yeah, it's ethereal. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, most people may or may not know this, but I I do know this. Uh, you have quite an eclectic taste in music. Um, so when I've worked with you on other projects, uh, namely uh, wine judging, uh, you're the first person I've ever met that judges a full flight of wines at the highest level with earphones on. And it's not just earphones to block out the noise, but it's playing music. So <laughs> tell us a little bit about uh, what you're listening to at the moment and how, how varied your music collection is, because yeah. from memory on one day you went from listening to the Dandy Warhols to listening to Tool during a panel of Shiraz or something like that. So, yeah, <laughs> what, are you listen, what are you listening to at the moment? It certainly comes down to to, to what sort of well, what mood I'm in, what variety I'm I'm sort of looking at. It's not just judging either. It's um, when I'm blending uh, our wines as well. It's I'll always have have the cans on and, and just try and I think it, it puts me in a sense of uh, a sense of relaxation that or a sense of ease that um, I get distracted quite easily from sounds. You know. All over the place, yeah. and then I yeah. lose my train of thought, and then I have to start again. So um, it's all about isolating my concentration, I guess, is a good way to, to put it. Um, and yeah, the, the music choice definitely does vary a lot. Tool is certainly a pretty constant constant thing, and <laughs> it's interesting. I think I think it's the it's the bass, like the bass rhythms that they that they use. It's kind of a, like a rumbling kind of music, and it um, it's the same thing with you know Queens of the Stone Age, like stoner rock sort of stuff is is probably my preferred you know favorite genre overall it's got that that real nice driving kind of um bass note to it and that that's what really kind of puts me in the in the zone and i don't do it all the time it's just just sometimes and and i'd say you know sometimes i want the distractions or i want to have a chat with someone next to me about a certain wine so it's horses for courses and and moods but uh yeah it's 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 very handy when when i need to just knuckle down and think hard and what do you listen to when you're making grenache are you blending grenache Oh, that could be anything. <laughs> Funnily enough, it goes usually back to my one of my first loves was um, Pink Floyd. So it usually goes back to something right. they did, Dark Side or or you know um, Animals, those sort of band, uh, those sort of albums. So yeah, that really puts me in a, in a good space. So. You uh, you opened my eyes to Tool. I always knew they were around and listened to yeah. bits of them. But then when you were doing your your judging, listening to the new Fear Inoculum album. Yeah, uh, and off that I started to really dig into that band, and then I saw them in concert in Sydney last year, and it was just an absolute mind-blowing um, experience. Uh, one of the very best gigs I've ever been to. Oh, they're so good. Um, yes. So yeah, I'm I'm right into that now. I think it's a wine thing. We're going to make it a wine industry compulsory band. Yeah. Um, tell us what you think is the new normal uh, for Australian wineries and the industry in general. At the moment, I mean, I asked the same question to the guys in South Africa and um, to Virginie over in New Zealand last week, and similar answers. Uh, I'd be keen to see uh, or, or get your feedback on on what you think the new normal will be. It's interesting. I think um, you probably split it into two halves. So there's there's the the restaurant and the wine bar side of things. So the, the on premise, the trade. Um, I see that as probably contemporising a lot of of the lists so you, know, you used to walk into a restaurant and then they put the list down and there was 50 pages of you know, all this different stuff um i don't think in certainly in the short to medium term places can can afford to do that anymore they, they can't just sit on stock because um there's a who knows month to month what's going to happen as far as operations go so so lists are going to get and they already have got very much more condensed and focused on on certain regions or certain varieties, certain styles, and I think that's actually a, a good thing. Um, much less confusing for people who who are looking for something rather than having to sway through all the all the the rest of it. Um, then the other side is is the retail. So we've we've switched to focusing on on retail quite strongly. Um, we from the start we were always a, a label that would be put on pour at wine bars and things like that. Uh, we were very on-premise sort of focused, uh, wine bar, wine restaurant focused. Um, but this time when everything shut down, um, we thought, well, let's let's look at the at the part of the business that we maybe neglected a little bit, um, which was dealing direct with with consumers and 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 retailers as well. So um, obviously retail spiked, um, which was which kept everyone in the wine trade sort of ticking along. Um, I'd say 80% of our business dropped away in a couple of months with the uh, 
with all the all the bars and things closed and export shut down and that's trickling back up now which is great but at the same time i want to focus on that on that retail and and consumer side too and that's part of the reason we're putting so much focus on on our tasting experiences here um a uh, new website on the on the way which is sort of going to be much more sort of visually um interactive and um and uh, louise is doing a lot of work on the on the social media and newsletters and things like that so um we want to be we want to be a little bit of a destination for people now rather than them rather than me saying yeah go and try it over here at this wine bar we can say well come here come we'll, we'll talk to you and, and and have a chat so um yeah i think it's actually there's there's a silver lining to it all um and 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 uh yeah we'll, we'll all come out on the other side and things will look different and i think mostly i think for the better to be honest once things have, have yeah. calmed down yeah. fantastic well i'm gonna let you get on with your friday night uh, down in the vale Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go find something to eat because it's uh, 7.51 in Sydney and it's Friday night. So it's uh, a bottle of uh, open uh, Grenache. Uh, can't go wrong. Nice. But, um, Rob, uh, thank you so much for your time and for your uh, pearls of wisdom and uh, for telling us a bit about your story. And uh, it's great to have um, our first Australian winemaker uh, as you. Uh, so um, all the best for the next couple of months. Uh, let's get through 2020 and into 2021 and hit the reset button. Um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, thank you for your time and for joining us. And um, that's it for this episode, everyone. So thank you for dialing in from home. And uh, we will see you with uh, a new episode coming up soon. You'll be notified via Facebook uh, as to who our next guest is. We've got some really cool things planned. I think we've got a a winery from South Africa with uh, three winemakers joining the call. So that's going to be interesting, keeping everyone in control or under control. But um, for now, it's uh, good night and stay safe. Have a great weekend. And thanks for joining us.